Last time, we talked about one of the analytic study designs called a case control study. Um, another feature of the another uh, analytic study design is to measure the relationship between disease and exposure. So um, in a case control study, the strength of the relationship between exposure and disease is quantified and compared using the odds ratio. So odds um, here is uh, defined as the ratio of the number of people with the disease of interest to the number of people without. And remember that the odds is not probability because this is a ratio, not a proportion. So it can go over one. Now, given an exposure, there will be two odds, right? One for the exposed and the other for the not exposed group. So you take the ratio of these two odds, then it will become the odds ratio, which is the ratio of the odds of having a disease given an exposure to the odds of having the disease without the exposure. So here is the step-by-step uh, -step procedure to calculate an odds ratio. First, you need to identify the number of cases with disease and healthy controls. Once you do that, then you need to further split the cases and controls based on their exposure status to a risk factor of interest. So the table shown here is what's called a two by two contingency table. Here are the columns and um, so the columns um, represents uh, the, the disease status of the disease of uh, the study sample and the rows represent the exposure status of the study sample. So here A um, represents the number of cases who are exposed to a certain risk factor under investigation, whereas B represents the number of health controls exposed to the same risk factor. And the C represents the number of cases who are not exposed to the risk factor. And finally, the D, R, D is the number of the healthy controls who are not exposed to the risk factor. Now, you may be wondering how you don't get disease when exposed to the same risk factor to which the cases are exposed. Conversely, um, how come you get disease when not exposed to, exposed to the risk factor? And in fact, I told you about this before. Um, there's a rarely a single definitive cause behind a disease. It is not one-to-one -one match relationship. The disease results, um, a disease uh, results from multiple risk factors and their interactions. So not all the cases are necessarily exposed to the same risk factor. By the same token, some, some people don't get sick even after they're exposed to the risk factor because of the individual differences in resilience or other factors. Therefore, the disease occurrence is inherently probabilistic interplay between different risk factors. So from this, we should estimate the risk um, with a given exposure for these four different possibilities, right? Um, to determine how more likely it is to catch the disease when exposed to a certain risk factor against when not exposed. Now you have to calculate the odds of having the disease for the exposed and the unexposed. So the odds of having disease when exposed is a over b right so this is the ratio um, of the cases to the controls have the controls when they are uh, exposed to the same risk factor right and what is the odds of the unexposed group it's um c so odds of having the disease over b right Now, um, the odds ratio is the ratio between these two odds. So it's an odds 
of the uh, odds of having the disease when exposed over odds of uh, having the disease when not exposed. So it's A over P over C over D. So you multiply these two and that goes to denominator. You see and multiply these two. AD. So this is the odds ratio AD over BC. Now this odds ratio is subject to NHST where the null is um, saying that odds ratio is equal to one or not statistically different from one. Uh, which is saying there is no difference in the odds of having disease between the exposed group and the unexposed group. On the other hand, the alternative is to say that the odds ratio is statistically different from one in two-tailed fashion. So in a nutshell, the idea is basically the same as the t-test where, um, so say if you take the uh, log, of O R. So that is actually log of A D over B C. And by the rule, um, if you still remember, A D minus log B C. And log of one is zero, right? So that is a null. So basically, we're testing the difference, but you know, when these two and quantities are the same, the difference will become zero, and the ratio will become one. So this is basically in the same form, right? So let's just take an example from here. Um, let's just erase and take a simple example. So for example, if the odds of having an AMD, so AMD plus, so you have AMD and AMD minus, so this is without, and the exposure here is a smoking. So smoker plus means that you're a smoker, and smoker negative means you're not smoker, right? So, I mean, typically it is thought that, you know, smoking is a risk factor to AMD, right? So, but um, just uh, you know, hypothetically, if the odds of having an AMD for being a smoker is five, and the odds of having the same disease for non-smoker is five, then there's no difference in the odds, right? In the odds, so smoking is not a risk factor to AMD. So in this case, um, the A, so that's A, B, C, D, right? So the odds of having AMD, right, when you're a smoker, so the odds smoking, um, so this is the odds of having disease when you're smoking, it's a 50 over 10, right, so which is B. And then odds of having AMD when you're not smoking is 50 over 10 again. Right, so the odds ratio is 50 over 10, 50 over 10. Right, so basically we have just same odds up and down so that is one so in this case um smoking is not a risk factor um because regardless of you know smoking and the odds of having the amd is basically the same so in this case you cannot say that smoking is a risk factor right on the other hand we have different odds now so if the odds of having AMD for being a smoker is five, so the odds smoking is again this to this, 
50 over 10, but odds of non smoke is now 10 over 10, which is 1. Now, odds ratio is basically 5 over 1, right? So now the odds of having AMD is whopping five times that of the um, non-smokers, right? Uh, odds of having the, uh, the AMD when you're not a smoker. So in this case, you can say that um, you know, smoking is um, a definitely risk factor. Well, not definitely. You don't know yet because uh, you don't know how much um, the odds ratio should be bigger than one to say that this is a statistically significant, right? So that, that is the question. The how big should be the odds ratio to say that is statistically greater than one? So is the odds ratio of five is statistically over and beyond one? So that is the question. So how do we determine the statistical significance of OR? You either compute p-value of observing the sample odds ratio or calculate the 95% confidence interval of the odds ratio to see if the interval includes no difference point, which in this case of odds ratio is one. Typically, 95% confidence interval is somehow more frequently reported than the p-value and you know you know that the idea of um, uh, how to make the uh, statistical decision is very similar to how to read 95 percent confidence interval of mean difference in case of t statistics so if the 95 percent confidence interval contains zero you know representing the zero difference right that means the mean difference is not statistically different from zero. It is only when both limits are negative or positive when the mean difference is statistically different from zero. Likewise, if the 95% confidence interval of odds ratio does not include one, uh, in this case, one represents no difference, right? That means odds ratio is statistically significant. Um, on the other hand, if the 95% confidence, confidence interval of the odds ratio contain include one in the interval, that means um, the risk, risk factor is not statistically significant in increasing the odds of having the disease. That's what it means. Again, the direction uh, matters. Okay. So if both limits of the um, confidence interval of the odds ratio are greater than one, then that means the exposure is harmful, like in smoking case, right? And whereas the exposure is beneficial when both limits are less than one, say like taking lutein, right, um, against AMD. So the direction matters, right, from one, from no difference point. If it is greater than one, then it is harmful. If it is less than one, it is beneficial. So statistical representation of odds ratio is basically the same as um, the confidence interval of the mean difference or the mean, sample mean. Right? So even though this M equation looks um, complicated, but it is not. It's really the same as the 95% confidence interval of the mean. So the confidence interval is uh, the OR sample odds ratio plus minus the confidence coefficient. So if it is a 95, then it's a 1.96, right? 2 plus minus 2, standard error of the odds ratio. That's all there is to it. And the confidence coefficient is exactly the same as the mean 
um, sample mean confidence interval. Um, but in calculating the 95% confidence interval uh, for odds ratio and the risk ratio or the relative risk um, is a bit convoluted compared to um, kind of, uh, calculate the 95% confidence interval for the mean. So these are the steps in calculating the 95% confidence interval of odds ratio. So let's just take a look at um, each step using worked example. So this is the um, actual data taken from the previous um, the Acanthamoeba keratitis investigation. So you're given um, the uh, two by two contingency table, each cell filled with the uh, number of um, cases and non-cases when exposed to the, uh, the multi-purpose solution or not exposed to that solution. So first you need to calculate um, the odds ratio. So odds ratio will become, so that's AD 40, times 125 and 15 times 32. So we need calculator. <clears throat> okay, so 40, 125. Okay, so it's about ten point four two, right? So now we calculated um, odds ratio. So what that means is that once you're exposed to that in a multi-purpose solution, so if you use that multi-purpose solution, right, to clean your lens, then you have 10 times more likely to catch keratitis compared to who did not use uh, the multi-purpose solution. So once you calculate this odds ratio, you need to take the natural log of that odds ratio. So this is um, and the results. Um, so let's just, so we have this value and see the LN. So that is for the natural log. So um, you just click and you get that, right? 2.3434 and so on. So that's what we have. Um, but once you have that, then you need to use this equation. Um, this is kind of simple. You just basically plug in each number from each cell to this equation to calculate the standard error of the natural log odds ratio. Okay, so that's how you calculate this. And so let's just plug in those numbers using the calculator again. Okay, so we have one over 40 plus one over 15 plus one over 32 and 25 holds this and you take the square root of it so you get that right point three six one eight that is a standard error of log um odds ratio so now the 95 percent confidence interval in log space we're still in log space is a natural log odds ratio plus minus 1.96 times standard error of the um, natural log odds ratio so this is what we have been um obtained right so 
If you do that, the lower limit is 1.6342 and the upper limit is 3.0526, which is still in the log space. So you need to do the um, uh, exponentiation on these both limits to put them back into the real space. And so you just take the uh, exponentiation of these limits, then you will get these values. So um, in the actual, um, not in log, log space, okay, so the real space, you have lower limit um, of 5.1254 and upper limit 21.1703. So the actual odds ratio was 10.42 and then 95% confidence interval um, is um, 5.13 and 21.17. And we know that this odds ratio should be um, placed in somewhere in the middle of this 95% um, confidence interval. Right. So let's just look at if these numbers are actually the right numbers. E to the lower limit, 1.632. That's 5.1254. Right. And... 3. That's 21.1703. Right? So those numbers are correct. Now we know that confidence interval, 95% confidence interval for this odds ratio are these two. And this is how you interpret the 95% confidence interval of odds ratio. So when you report, you need to state the conclusion in the original scale, not in the log scale. And you would just say something like the odds ratio for keratitis for the specific multipurpose solution compared to the non-use of the solution or different brand is 10.42, indicating the increased odds of keratitis for the, per, uh, for the people who use that specific solution. And the 95% confidence interval of the odds ratio, 5.13, 21.17, indicates that the odds of having keratitis are significantly higher for the group exposed to the specific brand of the multipurpose solution compared to the group without the exposure. Because the confidence interval does not contain one. So, um... This is uh, what I've been said already, what, I, what I've been just saying already. So an odds ratio um, close to one indicates no association between exposure and the disease. And if the 95% confidence interval of the odds ratio um, does not include one, then the result indicates a statistical significant association between the exposure and the disease. And if both limits of the confidence interval are greater than one, then the effect of the exposure is harmful, whereas both limits of confidence interval is less than one, then the effect of the exposure is beneficial. Now, here are the um, pros and cons of um, case control study. So the good things about case control study is that the study can provide stronger evidence than a cross-sectional study, and that is coming from the calculation of odds ratio, right? And it is a relatively efficient in time and cost because you don't have to wait until the disease occurs right because the, the case control study starts its investigation from the disease end so after everything is um, said and done 
now you start the investigation so it is relatively you know quick and um you don't have to spend a lot of uh, money on this and also it's uh, easier to study multiple exposures and their interactions related to a specific disease um as we have seen you know once you have disease and there are a list of um and possible uh, exposures um, that may have been related to the disease. So it's easier to study multiple exposures per disease, but not the other way around. Okay? Um, you cannot um, investigate multiple diseases uh, given an exposure with case control study. And finally, case control study is um, kind of ideal to study rare disease because because the diseases are rare. You know, it is always the case that you do not have enough cases to have um, you know meaningful statistics or whatnot. But you know, the case control study starts its investigation from the disease end, right? So by the time um, you start to run case control study um, you probably have already enough cases to um, proceed with the case control study so a case control study is um, you know suitable to study rare diseases and there are some other not so good things about case control study and the first one is um, case control studies are still limited in um you know deciding causal relationship between disease and exposure that's because you still cannot establish this temporality between the exposure and disease right because case case control study collect the data after disease has already occurred and then you're just going backward in time to find out the cause so um still and the case control study is missing the temporality. And, you know, this um, was um, discussed already. It is, um, you know, most time consuming part to um, match the case with the control group. So the control group should be, you know, uh, more or less comparable in every aspect um, to the case group except for that they don't have the disease and sometimes it gets really difficult to select in a matching control group and case control study is also subject to bias such as a selection or recall bias so here bias refers to um, any systematic error in any type of epidemiological study that result in an incorrect estimation of the association between exposures and the outcomes. So investigator can introduce bias into a study as a result of the procedures for um, identifying and enrolling subjects or from the procedures for collecting or analyzing information. Therefore, it is important for investigator to be mindful of potential biases in order to reduce their likelihood as much as possible when they are designing a study so at design stage um, because once bias has been introduced then it cannot be removed at the analysis stage and briefly a selection bias can result when the selection of subjects into a study or their likelihood of being selected in the study leads to a result that is different from what you would have gotten if you had enrolled the entire target population on the other hand recall bias occurs when there are systematic differences in the way subjects remember or report exposures or outcomes, which is typical in case control studies. For example, subjects with disease may remember past exposures differently than those who do not have the disease. So these are the things um, that the case control study is good for or not so good for.